Hey everyone, it's Professor Primerton. In this video, we're going to continue our discussion on more on functions and their graphs. So, based on the previous video, we left off with testing for symmetry. We're going to identify whether a function is even or odd, and also recognize what that means in terms of symmetry. And we're also going to use piecewise functions and also graph piecewise functions. So let's look at even and odd functions and what it means in terms of symmetry. There are some graphs of equations that have symmetry based on the function's equation and determining whether the function is actually even or odd. Now that has nothing to do with even number or odd number. It's a property that's involving functions. So here's a definition of even and odd function. A function is even if it satisfies this property. If you replace all the x's as the input with negative x and you get the exact same function as before for all the x values in the domain. In other words, the right side of the equation is saying the function stays the same whenever you replace x with negative x. Then the function is even function. On the other hand, the function is an odd function. If you do the same test, you replace x with negative x in parentheses, but this time you get the opposite of the original function for all values in the domain, and that means the original function is the opposite. It changes the sign whenever you change the sign of x. So let's try example four for identifying even and odd functions. We're going to determine whether the following functions are even, odd, or even possibly neither. So number one, the function that we're going to test is f of x equals negative three x to the fourth power plus two x squared and then plus six. So let's try out the test. We're going to replace x with negative x in terms of function notation. So take all the x's and replace them with negative x. So negative three times negative x to the fourth plus two times x is becoming negative x in parentheses when you substitute in and then plus six. Now to figure out whether the function will stay the same or whether it becomes the opposite of the function or maybe neither one of those, we need to simplify the function. So notice that you'll have five negative signs here. You have four negatives because of the negative to the fourth power and you also have a negative on the outside. So that makes it negative three x to the fourth when you simplify. You'll have two negative signs because the negative x times negative x makes it positive. So positive two x squared plus six. Now notice that we've simplified the function and we came up with the exact same function we had originally. So this is originally f of x. So notice that if we replace x with the negative x, we came up with the exact same function. That means f of x is an even function. So let's try another problem, number two. This time we're gonna have the function g of x is equal to negative two x to the fifth plus three x cubed, subtract four x plus seven. And we're going to do the exact same test as before. Take all the x values and replace them with a negative x. So we're gonna find out what is g of the opposite of x. So again, take all the x's and replace them with a negative x in parentheses. And then we'll simplify and find out if the function stays the same or does it change signs, or does it do a combination of both? So let's find out how many negative signs we have. You have five negative signs because negative x is being raised to the fifth power, and then you have a negative on the outside as well. So that's six negatives. Multiply together gives you positive two x to the fifth. Then you have three times negative x in parentheses cubed. There's three negatives, so negative three x to the third. Negative four times negative x is positive four x and then positive seven stays the same. So let's compare the two. The first term is the opposite sign. It was negative two x to the fifth, now it's positive two x to the fifth. The next term is three x cubed, now it's negative three x cubed. The third term is negative four x, and now it's four x. So it looks like it might be the opposite sign of the original function, but you have to compare the last term as well, and it stayed the same. So it's a combination of changing the signs and also staying the same. So this is neither neither even nor odd.
So if the function stays exactly the same, it's an even function. If the function becomes the opposite sign, it's an odd function, and this function was neither. So it's not even nor odd. So now we're going to look at what does even and odd functions tell us about properties involving their graphs. It turns out that if a function is even, its graph has a special type of symmetry. The graph will have symmetry with respect to the y-axis. So the y-axis is the symmetry line. That means any point that you have plotted, x comma y, then you will also have the point negative x comma y also on your graph. So let's try out this, this function. This function is x squared minus 4. So f of x equals x squared minus 4. Let's see if it actually is an even function. So we know the test to find out if it's even or odd. You replace the x with negative x in parentheses. So negative x all squared subtract 4. Simplify and you get x squared subtract 4, which is the exact as the original function. So if you replace x with negative x, in other words, the y values stay the same. So this is an even function. And so we just found out that if a function is even, then the symmetry line is the y-axis. So if you took the right side of the graph and folded it across this line, the y-axis, you'll get the left half of the graph. So you have a line of symmetry, which is the y-axis. And this is called y-axis symmetry. So let's test out one of the points. Let's say you have 3 comma 5 and you want to find out what is this mirror reflection. So if you have 3 comma 5, the even function test said if you replace the x with a negative x, the y values stay the same. That's what the test said if it's even. And it should be true for every single x value in the domain. So that's why you have this symmetry. So the statement says if a graph is an even function, which means it satisfies this property, f of negative x is equal to f of x, you will always have the graph symmetric with respect to the y-axis. Okay. On the other hand, if a function turns out to be odd, then the graph has another special type of symmetry, but this symmetry is with respect to the origin. Now, what that means is that if you have a point x comma y on the graph of the function, if you change the x value to its opposite sign, then the y value will also change its sign as well. And that's what the test for odd function said. So this function is y equals x cubed, or f of x equals x cubed. Let's test this function out to see if it's actually odd. So replace the x with negative x, and you get the opposite of x all to the third power. And notice that you have three negatives. That makes it the opposite of x cubed. And how does this compare with the original function? It's the opposite sign. So it's the opposite of the original f of x, which tells us that this function is an odd function. So notice that the graph is symmetric with respect to the origin. Okay, and then the origin is always 0, 0 on the graph. So let's take a look at the graph and what this means for origin symmetry. If you take a point x comma y, and you draw a line that goes right through the origin, 0 comma 0, where the, this line will intersect the graph again is its reflection. So that would be negative x and negative y. If you change the x to negative x, the y will also change to negative y. So let's do an example. Let's take the point 2 comma 8 on the graph and find out where is its reflection with origin symmetry. Well, you draw a line through the origin to 2 comma 8 and then that will be reflected that same line extends into this quadrant and you'll have negative 2 and negative 8 the x value changed from positive 2 to negative 2 and the positive 8 became negative 8 and that's why it has origin symmetry so let's just restate what we just found out if a function is odd it satisfies this property. If you replace all the x's with negative x with function notation, 
then your y values will become the opposite sign, and that means your graph will be symmetric with respect to the origin, which is 0, 0. So let's take a look at example 5. Determine which of the graphs is even, odd, or possibly neither, based on the symmetry. So let's look at the graph on the far left. Since this graph looks like it has y-axis symmetry, the y-axis is the symmetry line, this must be an even function based on its symmetry. So even though we don't know what the function's formula is or equation, we know it has to be an even function based on its symmetry, y-axis symmetry. So let's look at the graph in the middle. Notice that the point 1, 4, if you drew a line through the origin, you're going to find that the point negative 1 and negative 4 is also on the graph. And same thing for 4, 1. If you draw a line that goes through the origin, you're going to have the point negative 4 and negative 1. So it looks like this has origin symmetry, which makes it an odd function. So origin symmetry. Okay, and then the graph on the far right, let's see what type of symmetry it might have, if any. Let's test a couple points out. If this graph has y-axis symmetry, notice that negative 1, 3 is on the graph. Well, where would a mirror image be if it has y-axis symmetry? It would be over here if it has y-axis symmetry, and it doesn't have a point there. So it's not even because it does not have y-axis symmetry. So even if one point fails, it can't have that type of symmetry. And now let's test to see if the function's odd. Well, let's take the point 1, 1. If you drew a line through the origin, 0, 0, that should be at negative 1, negative 1. And it's not there. So this is not an odd function either. It has no origin symmetry. So this graph has no special type of symmetry, so it's neither even nor odd. Okay, so let's look at the next example. We're going to basically summarize everything we've learned from the previous two sections involving what information can we obtain from a graph about a function. So example six, we're going to be using this graph continuously to find out the following questions. Write any answers that involve domain and range or increasing, decreasing, using interval notation. So number one, find the domain and the range from this graph of the function. So let's look at the domain first. So remember that the domain are all the x values that make up the graph, the input values. Well, I notice that the graph has an arrow on the far left. That means the graph will go down, but it also goes to the left. So it's going to go to the left forever, toward negative infinity. And then also the far right end has an arrow and I notice that there are no gaps in my x values, so this will go up to positive infinity. The range is all the y values, or all the output values that make up the graph. Well, we already noticed that the graph goes down forever, so negative infinity. Now, how high does the graph go? What's its highest y value? It looks like its y is 4 is the largest. And, is there a parenthesis or a bracket? Well, there is a point there because the graph passes through it. So square bracket. Okay, number two, determine any intercepts of the function from the graph. So let's go back and look at the graph and see what type of intercepts it has. So remember that an x-intercept is where the graph crosses or touches the x-axis. It looks like the graph crosses the x-axis at negative 4, 0. Make sure it's a point. And it also crosses the x-axis at 4, 0. So negative 4, 0 and 4, 0 and the graph will cross the y-axis at 0, 1, which is the y-intercept. So x-intercepts, there were two of them, negative 4, 0, and positive 4, 0. And the y-intercept was where the graph crossed the y-axis. It was 1, 0, 1. Okay, part 3. Find the intervals on which the function is increasing, decreasing, or constant. So we talked about this in the previous video. Let's go back and look at the graph again. 
keep in mind that increasing and decreasing also uses just the x values. So it looks like the graph is increasing first from the left. You always read the graph from left to right. It's increasing from negative infinity for the x values, and it stops increasing when you get to negative 2, which is the x value. Then it's also increasing from x equals 0 to x equals 3. And it's decreasing from x equals negative 2 to x equals 0. And from x equals 3 to infinity, the graph is also decreasing. So let's write out these intervals with interval notation. The graph is increasing, we said, from negative infinity until negative 2. And also from 0 to 3. Make sure you only use parentheses with increase and decreasing, and just the x values. And the graph was decreasing from negative 2 to 0, union 3 to infinity. And constant, it never happened. So none. All right, let's look at number 4. This time it's asking us to do something that we haven't talked about yet. Find the values for which f of x is less than or equal to 0. Let's change the problem to be a little bit more familiar. This means the same thing as y is less than or equal to 0 because f of x can be replaced with y. So let's see what we can understand before we look at the graph. If your y values are less than 0, that means they're negative. So if y is less than 0, what does this mean in terms of a graph? The graph is below the x-axis. Okay, so that answers that part. And then what if you were equal to 0? Well, if y equals 0, then the graph is on the x-axis. Okay, so with this in mind, now let's look at the graph. We want all the x values that are below the x-axis or on the x-axis. So notice that the graph is below the x-axis for all the, the x values that are less than negative 4, on the left side of negative 4, and also x values larger than x equals 4. You're below the x-axis. And we already said that you're on the x-axis at negative 4, because that was an x-intercept, and you're on the x-axis at x equals 4, because that's also an x-intercept. So how would you write this in terms of interval notation? Well, it's all the x values on the left side of negative 4, but you do want to include negative 4 because it's on the x-axis. So bracket, union, and then we said that you're on the x-axis at 4, so square bracket on 4, and you're below the x-axis for any value larger than 4. So infinity with a parenthesis. So these are all the values of x where the graph is below or on the x-axis. Okay, number 5. Find the x values at which f of x has a relative maximum, and then what is or what are the relative maxima. So in other words, we're looking for the top of the hill. So notice that the graph will have a couple relative maximum. You have a relative maximum at x equals negative 2. That's the input value where it occurs. And also at x equals 3. Now what are the relative maximum or maxima? Well, you have a hill when y is 4, and you have a hill when y is 2. So let's write this down. You have a relative maximum at, now these are the x values, if you use the word at, it was x equals negative 2, and x equals positive 3. Now, what is or what are the relative maxima? Well, now you're looking for what are the values. So these are the y values. The relative maximum was y equals 4 and y equals 2, respectively. So notice the difference between the words at. Those are locations. And if you use the word is or are, those are the y values. Those are what is the relative maximum. What's the highest y value? Okay. Similarly, what's number six? Find the x values at which f of x has a relative minimum, and what are the relative minima. So notice with the graph that there's only one relative minimum. It occurs when you have a lowest part of a valley, which is here. The relative minimum occurs at x equals zero, 
and the relative minimum is 1. So relative minimum at x equals 0, that's the location, and the relative minimum is y equals 1. Okay, and then something that we just recently talked about, number 7, is this function an even function, odd function, or possibly neither? And that's based on the symmetry of the graph. So let's look at the graph again, one last time. Does this graph have y-axis symmetry? If it does, it's an even function. So notice that there was a relative maximum when x is negative 2 and the y is 4. Well, if you look across the y-axis, there is no point at positive 2, comma 4. So it's not y-axis symmetry, so it's not even. And notice that the graph does not look like it has origin symmetry either. So if I take the point 3, comma 2 and I draw a line through the origin, I should get negative 3, comma negative 2. And there's no point there. So it does not have origin symmetry, which means the function's not odd either. So this function is neither even nor odd. And the reason why is no y-axis symmetry. nor origin symmetry. So this is a good problem that we summarized everything we learned in the previous two sections. Increasing, decreasing constant, relative max, relative min, symmetry, and I also talked about when is a graph on the x-axis or crossing the x-axis, where does the graph cross the y-axis for intercepts. Okay, the last topic in this video we're going to look at is what's called piecewise functions. So Suppose that a telephone company offers the following plan. Here's an example of a piecewise function. You have $20 per month for your telephone company every month, and you pay that for 60 minutes. Any additional time beyond 60 minutes, they charge you extra beyond the $20. They charge you 40 cents for every additional minute. We're going to write what this means in terms of a function where the monthly cost, the total monthly cost, is capital C, that's the function's name, and the function depends on the number of calling minutes, which is lowercase t. Let's take a couple notes. Whenever t, the calling minutes, are less than or equal to 60, so in other words, if you use less than or equal to 60 minutes in a month, then how much does it cost you? $20. Then C of T would be just $20. However, the formula will change when you go beyond 60 minutes. So this is why it's called a piecewise function. So if T is greater than 60 minutes, then we need to find out a different formula for C of T. You have $20 that you've used this first 60 minutes, and then you are charged 40 cents for each additional minute. So notice that it's 0 0.40 for 40 cents. It's not just T, because if I call someone for 70 minutes, I'm going to be charged just 10 times of the 40 cents each minute. So it should be T subtract 60. So I, whatever I plug in for T, I have to subtract 60 first to find out how many additional minutes I'm charged. So let's put these two things together, and this is why it's called a piecewise function. You have this curly bracket that gives you a grouping of two different functions. The first function, it's 20, comma, now the condition of why it is $20 is when t is less than or equal to 60. And then the other function is 20 plus 40 cents times t subtract 60, and that is the function if t is greater than 60 minutes. And this is why it's called a piecewise function, or piecewise defined function. So let's look at the graph before we talk about example 7. If you call someone for 60 minutes, you're going to be charged a flat rate of $20. So it's going to be constant between t equals 0 and t equals 60 on the graph. 
But then notice, starting at t equals 60, you're charged 40 cents for each additional minute. So the graph will start increasing 40 cents for one minute, 40 cents for another minute, 40 cents, and so on, 40 cents, and so on. So that's the second part of the graph. It actually gives you a line that's increasing from left to right. So the definition of a piecewise function is that if you have two or more equations over a specified domain, then it's called a piecewise function. So let's look at example seven. We're going to use the exact same function that we, that we just came up with. So evaluating a piecewise function, we're going to use this function, c of t is equal to 20 if you're between 0 and 60 minutes, and it's 20 plus 40 cents times t minus 60 in parentheses if t is greater than or equal to 60. Find and interpret c of 40 and c of 80. So let's find out c of 40 first. Let's find out the value and then we can interpret it later. So 40 means it's the value of t, because we're plugging that in for the independent variable. Well, I need to figure out which of the two functions am I going to use, because I can't use both functions. It's broken up in a way, so I'm only going to be paying attention to one of the functions over the other. So if t is 40, I look at the condition first. 40 is between 0 and 60 minutes, so I'm only going to use this function, just 20. And there is no value to plug in because it does not have a t, so the output is $20. Now what does this mean? If there is a calling time of 40 minutes, in a month, then the total cost is $20. Which makes sense, because the company was only charging us a flat rate of $20 as long as we stayed under the 60 minutes. If we use 40 minutes, we're under that. Okay, the other value, find and interpret C of 80 this time. So as you can imagine, this time we are using 20 minutes more than we are allowed, up to 60. So let's go up to the function. I'm not using the first function anymore because I'm not in between 0 and 60 anymore. I'm greater than 60. So I'm going to be using this second part of the function. It says 20 plus 40 cents times t subtract 60. So t is 80, subtract 60. And so if you calculate this, it will be $20. And then they're charging you $8 because you've gone 20 minutes over. So your monthly charge will be $28. So we found the value, but now we need to interpret what does this answer actually mean. So if there is a calling time of 80 minutes in a month, then the total cost is $28. So don't just find the values, make sure you also interpret them. So this is how you can evaluate a piecewise function. It depends on what value are you plugging in for your independent variable, which in this case is t. So I need to figure out which of the two formulas am I going to use, because you cannot use both. Okay, so then on the same theme as piecewise functions, now we're going to graph a piecewise function and also find out the domain and range. So the function that we're going to graph is broken up into three different pieces this time. So curly bracket, the first function is negative 2x plus 1, and it's for x values that are greater than or equal to negative 3 and less than 1. The function is just 2 if x is equal to 1, and the function becomes x squared if x is greater than 1. So notice that this function is broken into three different pieces. We're going to graph each of them separately. So let's give these names. Let's do the top one. We'll call it number one. The second we'll call number two. And then the bottom will be number three. So let's focus on the first part, number one. We need to find out where does the graph start and where does the graph end. And that's using the x values that are given. So the graph starts when you're far to the left at negative 
x equals negative 3. So let's find out what is the y value when x is negative 3. It's negative 2 times negative 3. I'm using only the top function because I'm using x equals negative 3 plus 1. And this gives us 7. So this is a point, negative 3 comma 7. So we're going to plot points so we can graph. Now the graph will end when x is equal to 1. So that would be negative 2 times 1 plus 1, which is negative 2 plus 1, or negative 1. So 1 comma negative 1. So before we start graphing, let's figure out are these points included or not. If the x value is or equal to the value, you do include it. So negative 3 comma 7 is going to be a closed dot. It's included as part of the graph. 1 comma negative 1, now notice that x is not equal to 1. It's just less than 1. So I'm not including this point. So it's an open dot. Okay, let's go to number 2 now. Number 2 says when x is equal to 1, so I'm only allowed to plug in x equals 1. So let's find out what the y value is. If I plug in x equals 1, there is no x value to plug in, so the y value is always 2. So this gives us a point. When x is 1, y is 2. And this is a closed dot because x is equal to 1. And that's it for the second part. And then the third part, we are trying to find out where's the graph start and end. Well, it starts when x equals 1. So f of 1. Now notice that we're using the bottom part now. So it would be 1 squared, which is 1. So that's 1 comma 1. And notice that x is greater than 1, not equal to. So this will be an open dot. Now, this one has no upper bound for the x values. In other words, x can be as large as I want as long as it's greater than 1. So I can plug in different x values to get an idea what the graph might look like. So let's plug in 2. So if you plug in 2 into the bottom part only, you get 2 squared, which is 4. So that's 2 comma 4. Now, 2 is greater than 1. That is true. So this is a closed dot. Now, I can also plug in x equals 3 into this bottom part. And if I do, I get 3 squared, which will be 9. So that's 3 comma 9, which is also a closed dot because 3 is larger than 1. So this should be enough points for us to actually graph. Now, let's graph each piece separately. So the first part of the graph, we notice that there was a closed dot at negative 3, 7. So if we're counting the y-axis by 2, then negative 3, 7 would be negative 3 and up to about right here. And that is a closed dot because we were including x equals negative 3. 1 comma negative 1 is an open dot. So positive 1, negative 1 would be right there. It's an open dot. And if you plot enough points, you will find out that this graph is just a straight line between these two points. So the graph starts when x is equal to negative 3, and it ends when x is 1, but not including 1. So this is the first part of the graph. I'm just going to label it as 1 so that we get an idea of which part we're actually finished with. So number two, we need to plot the point 1 comma 2. So 1 comma 2 would be here, and that is a closed dot. And that is the second part of the graph, just a single point. And now the third part. We've chose to plug in 1. 1 comma 1 is an open dot. So 1 comma 1 would be here, so an open circle. Then we also have the point 2 comma 4, which would be here, and it's a closed dot. And we also had 3 comma 9, which would be a little bit off my graph, but it fits right there. So notice that this part of the graph, I can plug in any x value that I want, and it looks like it's more like a parabola. And notice that the x values can be as large as I want, as long as it's greater than 1. So the graph has no upper bound. The graph will continue indefinitely up and to the right. So make sure you have an arrow.
And this is the third piece of the graph. So this is what a piecewise function might look like in terms of the graph. The graph will also be in pieces. You have one piece that's a line segment. The second piece was just a single point. And the third piece is part of a parabola or a U-shaped graph. So we're not finished yet. We need to talk about the domain and range. So domain. Domain is how far does the graph go to the left versus how far does the graph go to the right and are there any gaps in your x values? Well, the graph goes no farther to the left than x equals negative 3, and that is a closed dot, so bracket. Notice that there are no gaps in the x values. This line segment, segment goes up to x equals 1. This point is at x equals 1, and this parabola part, this u-shaped graph, takes care of all the x values to the right of 1, so there is no gap. So it goes up to infinity with a parenthesis. And now the range, which are all the y values that make up the graph, but this goes in a certain direction. It's down, up, always down, up in terms of the y-axis. So how far down does the graph go? Well, no lower than the y value negative 1, and it's an open circle. So do not include negative 1, so parenthesis. How far up does the graph go? Well, I notice the graph will go up forever, and there are no gaps in my y values. So this will go up to infinity with a parenthesis. So that gives you the domain range for this piecewise function. So this is a good place to stop. If you have any questions about how to graph piecewise functions or how to evaluate piecewise functions or how to test functions whether they have a special type of symmetry, whether functions are even or odd, please let me know. Or if you have any questions while you work on the homework for this section, please let me know that as well. And I'll see you at the next video when we finish up our section on finding the difference quotient.